Welcome to Politics Done Right. I am your host, Egberto Willis. This is a progressive program that will take the mystery out of politics. This is the program that will encourage you to make sure government becomes we the people. Whether you are liberal, progressive, conservative, or otherwise, you get to hear your point of view. We are an independent media outlet that unlike mainstream media beholden to corporations, we only owe allegiance to you. Remember, you can also send me a tweet at E-G-B-E-R-T-O-W-I-L-L-I-E-S. That is at Egberto Willis. Let us engage. It is politics done right. Welcome to Politics Done Right from the studios of KPFT 90.1 FM, Houston, your community radio station. We have a great program for you today. You know, last night I was following the Ukraine uh, fiasco all night. That's why I'm all teary-eyed and sleepy because I, I just didn't get enough sleep. But I tell you that, um, you know, it, it is very disappointing to see that one country goes into another sovereign country because they believe that they have the right to. Now, there's a whole lot of whataboutism going on with uh, with Ukraine right now. I mean, one would say that has Russia done anything the United States uh, don't do as well? And we would al- always come from, well, we are doing it from the position of benevolence while Russia and others are doing it from a, another position. The truth of the matter is each person or each country think they're doing it from a position of benevolence as they see it. The fact is that one should never, one should never infringe on the rights of the established borders of another country. That's just not only international law, that is just how it should be. Um, so uh, there's a whole lot of whataboutism that that goes on where people are saying, "Well, we shouldn't be involved with, uh, we, we we you know we shouldn't allow Russia to do what it's doing." And the truth of the matter is, we shouldn't, and we're putting on the necessary sanctions. Should Americans uh, shed blood in Ukraine? I mean, the, the truth is that they may they may hold on and not do anything for Ukraine, and if things ex- exacerbate, remember World War One, remember World War Two. That's it. Today we have a great program because we are going to speak to somebody on the ground right there. Uh, Terrell uh, Germain Star is how we're going to end it today. It's a, a, a substantive interview that will give you some history of Ukraine. He knows all there is to know about what's going on in that part of the world. A lot of stuff that isn't covered on the mainstream media. We're also going to speak to Harvey Wasserman. There's something that's not spoken about. The amount of nuclear reactors out there like Chevernol that could create problems if uh, People get scared and leave it alone and have it overheat, melt down. There's a whole lot of things. Now, Biden has been also getting the bad rap from Republicans as far as being weak, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The truth of the matter is uh, Condoleezza Rice doesn't think that way. Condoleezza Rice, a former uh, assistant to President Bush, Bush number two, uh, and if she thinks something is hard to believe that others, uh, that anybody on the right should think otherwise. Folks, we're in fun raising uh, drive, but we're not going to spend all our time there. We have a lot to cover. I do want you to support us the best you can, because again, we bring you information that you don't normally get elsewhere. So, um, Please, this is a solid program today on more than Ukraine, but on Ukraine. We are in our winter fun drive, but folks, please stick with me. I'm not just going to give you a fun drive pitch. I'm not just going to be doing a whole lot of pitching and pitching and pitching. I'm going to do a short pitch here at the beginning. I'm going to do a slight little pitch in the middle, and then at the end, a small pitch. Don't forget, please support the show. Support the station as well. Why am I asking you to support KPFT 90.1 FM Houston? It is extremely important. Remember that KPFT embraces cultural diversity. We represent the entire Houston, the entire metropolitan area. We represent the entire country. KPFT supports programming that's not the status quo. We challenge the status quo. We don't give you what the corporatocracy just want to give you. We are here to tell you not only the truth, but to express it in a way that that we all understand. That's KPFT's job. We are not trying to forget the past. We embrace the past. And 
We are there to celebrate the future because things change. What am I saying? Please remember KPFT 90.1 FM is a gem. We are in the process of moving. We are in the process of relocating to a new space. We need you more than we have ever needed you before to keep this thing going. Over 50 years of giving you great info, not only progressive programming, but alternative pro- uh, programming. What do we mean by alternative programming, we mean things that you are not going to get elsewhere. We also mean telling you the truth about things that others may not want you to know. So please remember, folks, call 713-526-5738. Again, that number is 713-526-5738. But even better, visit kpft.org, click the donate button, make sure you select politics done right for the program. The form will give you, please get one of my several books out there. As I see it, Class Warfare, the only resort to right-wing doom for a contribution of $120. It's worth it. How to talk to your right-wing relatives, friends, and neighbors for a contribution of $120. How to make America utopia, take away the economy from those who rigged it for a pledge of $120. Get any two of those books for $200, any three of those books for $250. The Contributions for my books go directly to support our station, KPFT 90.1 FM. Alternatively, folks, please get your basic KPFT-only membership for $40, a Pacifica-only membership for $25, or choose from one of our many other gifts for your contribution. Just go to kpft.org, choose Politics Done Right for the program, and select an option either for our books or something else to support the station. It is definitely worth it. You know what we always say in the long run? Let's get busy. You know, uh, a lot of a lot of people on the right like to criticize how Biden is working with Russia. You know, I have some issues uh, as as Terrell also illustrated with the U.S. Ukraine policy, U.S. Ukraine NATO policy. But uh, you know, as Terrell said, we shouldn't be doing what about isms. We should not be doing what about isms. Uh, and you know what? It seems to me like somebody the the right really really loves agrees not only with Terrell but they agree with quite a few other folks. Let's go ahead and play this right now. But I remember giving a talk um, to a group of Ukrainian young legislators a few years ago, and I said, I know you have a difficult international situation, but imagine if the FRG, the Federal Republic of Germany, had said for that 45 years, well, we really can't progress until we have our eastern half. Uh, we can't get stronger. We can't build an economy. We can't build a democracy. But instead, they did quite the opposite. They built a powerful democracy. They built a powerful economy. And when the time came, the East Germans wanted to be a part of that not the other way around. And so I would say to the Ukrainians and to the Ukrainian people, this is a very sad and difficult time. I hope that we are supporting uh, Ukraine's aspirations strongly enough. I have to say that I think that the Biden administration is, is playing a difficult hand rather well these days. And it is ultimately, though, up to the Ukrainian people and their leadership uh, to keep trying to build that strong, democratic, uh, independent Ukraine that is fighting corruption and building an economy. Um, it can be done. You know, earlier this year, um, Condoleezza Rice appeared on The View, and she wanted us to get away from January 6th. So I was really concerned whether Condoleezza Rice was going all Trump crazy as well. And, um, you know, we know Trump has criticized Biden, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, after I saw this yesterday, I said, you know, I got to air this one because Condi may be getting back into where she's always been, which was, I mean, we, we, we couldn't believe that she worked for Bush, but that's okay because as it turns out, she's going back to just where 
we expected her to be a conservative woman who believe in some neoliberal policies, uh, you know, a part of the world. That's who she is. But at least she's not a Trumpian. So that is important. It's good that she realizes that based on our current neoliberal being, Biden is just following the script as good as Clinton, Obama, or Bush 1 and 2 would have. Our military script, irrespective of parties, except under certain conditions, generally is the same. The military industrial complex runs everything. Today, we're going to talk to Harvey Wasserman. Thank you, Egberto. It's good to be with you, although I wish we had a happier topic to talk about. Well, look, we uh, from what you're what we're talking about, this part here is not going to be political. There's a whole lot of stories going around on on all sides with this politics that personally, I don't fully understand, even though I've uh, interviewed a lot of people. But you have a specific issue relative to nuclear reactors. Why don't you tell our audience what's going well, on? Here's the bottom line. There are 15, count them, one, five atomic reactors at four sites that are operating now in Ukraine, including six at a place I can't pronounce, Zaporozhye, something like that, which, and those six, and that's a lot of nukes to have at a single spot, are very close to the region that's being contested by the Russians. In addition to that, while the Russians are threatening Ukraine with war, they're also uh, integral to the operation of these four nuclear plants, four nuclear plants, 15 reactors. It's a nightmare. It's a, it's a catastrophe. If if Vladimir Putin wanted to lob a single mortar shell at one of the six reactors in uh, that that are near him, he could cause a global a global apocalypse that will make Chernobyl look like child's play. And nobody is talking about the fact that we have fifteen reactors in now what's become a war zone. I mean, it, it is the ultimate nightmare of the so-called peaceful atom. More than a million people were killed by Chernobyl. The damage that was done is in, incalculable. And here we are looking at it again. So what, what do we do about this? Exactly what has to be done? I mean, uh, it, it, is, it, it is kind of baffling that adults can be so, uh, so ridiculously inept at policy. What do we do? It's, all those reactors have to be shut. And the, Ukraine really can't afford to do it. They get more than 40% of their electricity from, from those reactors. And here, they're dependent on Putin to run those reactors, and he's threatening him with war. And, you know, the, the 12 of the 15 reactors in Ukraine are more than 30 years old. They were built by the old Soviet Union, for God's sakes. And, and, and we're dependent on the highest level of operating capability to keep those reactors from blowing up. And, and, and look what's going on there. No matter what you think about Russia or Ukraine, these reactors are there. They're completely vulnerable. Any attack, eight, eight, 10 guys could go in there. Uh, you know, one mortar shell could turn those places into an absolute apocalypse. This is the bitter fruit of the peaceful atom. And here we are, you know, if you had written this scenario, they would have dismissed you as being crazy or anti-nuclear or whatever. This is the reality. 15 atomic reactors in the war zone. I mean, come on. It, now, are, we, now you're, cut, are you telling me that in the Dunbar's area that there are some of these reactors as well? The six at Zaporozhye, however you pronounce it, I'm sorry, um, are, are within a couple hundred miles. That's wow. all they got to be. You, you got to... You, uh, atomic reactors, if you have a problem with the cooling system, if you have a problem with the uh, control panel or, the, or, or, or the any, anything, any of the pipes are cracked, any, any breakdown, if, if the, if the, uh, what if the crew uh, gets spooked and leaves, which has happened? Uh, you know, uh, there, I can sit here for the next hour and give you 100 scenarios where those six reactors, you know, in the United States, there are only three. There's only a couple of sites in the U.S. where there's a maximum of three reactors. To have six reactors at a single site within a, even a couple hundred miles of a potential war zone is 
absolutely insane. This is, this is actually more serious. Dangerous. Yeah, this is a kind of serious because, I mean, if you're telling me that they get, they're getting 40% of your electricity from these reactors, you're actually telling me that even the capital city of Kiev is uh, probably at risk of oh. actually being just blacked out, right? It could, be, it could go dark. I mean, you know, that Ukraine is, is very, very dependent on these reactors. They, they, and even at Chernobyl, you've got the old core, which is covered by basically an awning. Yeah. That costs $2 billion. You have three other reactors there that have been shut since 2000, but there's tons and tons and tons of radioactive waste there. I mean, you know, the Ukraine is a sitting radioactive duck. And, and the, the radio, radiation from Chernobyl went all over the world. It was detected in New England. It killed birds in California. I mean, you know, this is a global apocalypse on the brink of happening. If it, all the, you know, if Putin wakes up tomorrow and decides, ah, to heck with it, and throws three shells at, at the, the six reactors in, in, that are near him, it's over. Yeah, you know, Ukraine is over. Radioactive cloud. These reactors have to be shut. And, and, and somebody's got to deal with Ukraine's power supply. It could not be worse, uh, 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 Egberto, 15 reactors in a potential war zone. You have got to be kidding me. Now, I mean, let me ask you the, the, the foolish question now, Harvey. So what do we do from here? What, what, what responsibility does the United States have, NATO, et cetera? What happens going forward? They've got to provide backup power to Ukraine, and they've got to shut all those reactors. And even that's not enough. A shut reactor is still vulnerable. And just to give you some kind of perspective, Fukushima had emitted 100 times more radioactive cesium than was, re- than was released at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Imagine that, 100 yeah. 100 times more. And, you know, with six reactors at a single site within a couple hundred miles of a war zone, you ha- I mean, it couldn't be worse. It's a, it's a nightmare. Nobody's talking about this. Well, now you are. So, you know, you're the first to get on the air with this. It's, it's, it's absolutely terrifying. And you're right. Nobody, why? Because the nuclear industry has 400 reactors worldwide. There are 93 in the United States, virtually all of them more than, not, more than 30 years old. You, you know, with a 30-year-old reactor, anything can go wrong at any time. So if you introduce instability into the region, which is now being done, um, um, you know, we can lose a cooling system. We can lose a, an operating crew. Uh, you know, I mean, anything can happen with these reactors. So all these people that just want warmongering, I mean, uh, oh, uh, if Putin misbehaves, we just go blow crap up or whatever. Or even Putin, if he feels that he's in a vulnerable condition, could actually do something. Uh, this requires a whole lot of... Uh, Smart diplomacy, eh? <laughs> you know, it would take, uh, you know, one millionth of the Russian arsenal to create a global apocalypse. Right. I mean, not even a, a two mortar shells would be required to hit the cooling system, um, spook the uh, operators, whatever you want. Uh, right. Like I said, I could bore you for the next hour. So uh, th- this is beyond serious and it's amazing nobody's nobody's talking about so let me ask you harvey what are you doing about it with your team of folks are you guys uh, i mean you came here to give me that information are are you guys i understand that some of the folks have already been triggering some of the folks in the defense department who i think should know this stuff well actually thanks to eileen proctor i did get a message to a, a person who has since sent that message to people very high in the pentagon I, they know they can't not know about this. Right. They just don't want it in the media because the nuclear industry, uh, we, as I say, there's 400 reactors worldwide. Most of them are 30 years old or older. All of them in the United States, with one exception, are 30 years or older. You know, it takes nothing. It, it's like driving down a highway full of potholes in, in a 1980 Volkswagen. I mean, you know, it's just. It's a, it's an insane situation. Well, look, Harvey, absolutely Wasser- terrifying. Harvey Wasserman, look, thank you so kindly for bringing us this information. We're definitely going to put this out there all over because uh, this is something that it does. I mean, it, they may it may seem like they're way over there, 
But that stuff gets into the Baltic Sea. That thing gets into the Mediterranean. That thing gets everywhere, ultimately speaking, and through the the jet, the different jet streams that they are. So thank you so kindly for bringing that up in uh, to our attention. Um, anything else that you'd like to, to tell us before we leave? Well, look, this is the uh, ultimate reason why we want to go uh, to green energy. And, um, you know, these guys who want to talk about the wonders of nuclear power and carbon and all that stuff, it's ridiculous. Uh, anyone, any of the slightest mis- miscalculation at any one of these 15 reactors uh, is, is apocalyptic. And, uh, and so if you want it, your listeners want any more further debate about why nuclear power plants need to be shut and why we can't build any more of them and why we need to shift immediately to wind and solar and batteries and LED, this is it. I mean, you know, uh, uh, Putin gets up on the wrong side of the bed and we're all going to be showered in radiation. That's the bottom line. Arve Wasserman, thank you so kindly for having been on Politics Done Right. Thank you, Alberto. And you are the first. You put this out, you'll be the first. Don't forget, please support the show. Support the station as well. Why am I asking you to support KPFT 90.1 FM Houston? It is extremely important. Remember that KPFT embraces cultural diversity. We represent the entire Houston, the entire metropolitan area. We represent the entire country. KPFT supports programming that's not the status quo. We challenge the status quo. We don't give you what the corporatocracy just want to give you. We are here to tell you not only the truth, but to express it in a way that we all understand. That's KPFT's job. We are not trying to forget the past. We embrace the past and we are there to celebrate the future because things change. What am I saying? Please remember KPFT 90.1 FM is a gem. We are in the process of moving. We are in the process of relocating to a new space. We need you more than we have ever needed you before to keep this thing going. Over 50 years of giving you great info, not only progressive programming, but alternative uh, programming. What do we mean by alternative programming, we mean things that you are not going to get elsewhere. We also mean telling you the truth about things that others may not want you to know. So please remember, folks, call 713-526-5738. Again, that number is 713-526-5738. Three, eight. But even better, visit kpft.org, click the donate button, make sure you select politics done right for the program. The form will give you your donate and gift options. Please get one of my several books out there. As I see it, Class Warfare, the only resort to right-wing doom for a contribution of $120. It's worth it. How to talk to your right-wing relatives, friends, and neighbors for a contribution of $120. How to make America utopia, take away the economy from those who rigged it for a pledge of $120. Get any two of those books for $200, any three of those books for $250. The contributions for my books go directly to support our station, KPFT 90.1 FM. Alternatively, folks, please get your basic KPFT only membership for $40, a Pacifica only membership for $25, or choose from one of our many other gifts for your contribution. Just go to kpft.org, choose Politics Done Right for the program and select an option either for our books or something else to support the station it is definitely worth it you guys know we've been covering a lot of the russia ukraine issues right now today we are honored to have the host of black diplomats podcast foreign affairs journal uh, he's in Kiev right now, and he knows all there is to know about it. As you know, we brought Norman Solomon and a few other people here. Well, we have somebody in the field right now. Welcome to Politics Done Right. Terrell Germain Starr, how are you doing today? I'm good, brother. And by the way, um, I'm so excited about my painting, by the way. This is, uh, you know, this is a Black Ukrainian woman. I just want people to know that when it was commissioned, and uh, it was painted by a woman that was from Donetsk who was displaced out of Donetsk, where the conflict is taking place. And now she is in Odessa, which is a southern city on the Black Sea. 
I've named her Svet Quisha, you know, Svetlana and Keisha, Svet right. Quisha. You know what I'm saying? I just want to introduce y'all to, to her for those who, who are able, if you got the video on to see it, you know. Well, I, I tell you what, I'm going to make sure that it's be, it's seen. But before I even get started, you just got me into thinking. So we're going to talk about Russia and Ukraine right now. But I think what you've just brought to our audience is we've never thought, we, we know that, that that everywhere have people of all, all ethnicities, etc. But for some reason, we have never, at least I have never seen them display anyone of any other ethnicity in uh, in in Ukraine. So tell me, are there a lot of uh, people of color in Ukraine? Yes, and so I'm, I, that's an excellent question. Thank you for asking. I'll give break down why you don't see um, Black Ukrainian Ukrainians in coverage. And so Black Ukrainians, well, Black people were introduced into this region around the late 1700s through Catherine, you know, through the um, when Catherine the Great uh, ran the Russian Empire, and so uh-huh. they came through the Ottoman Empire. Okay. And so, and the reason why you saw that introduction of Black people into the uh, Russian Empire was because the Ottomans, again, they were a part of the slave trade, and so they were introduced kind of as "quote unquote" presents to Catherine the Great, and so they served in her court, you know, as servants, right? And so. You will see, you know, there there are historical documents that depict black people in Catherine the Great's court, and so now, in regards to the migration of those black people and how they proliferated, you know, that research is still being discovered. But there are black Ukrainians here. There's not a lot of census data because, you know, there there it's just simply not covered. So there are estimates that there are several thousand black Ukrainians, which basically comes down to one black parent. And then one Ukrainian parent. Um, now there are African students here. They they number in the tens of thousands. Most of them are from Nigeria, and so they are just students. They studied and they graduate. But the ones who are native born, it can range anywhere from five thousand to fifteen thousand. That you know, and they're all guesstimates basically. But you don't see a lot of Black Ukrainians in in in, in reporting because. You know, for example, I'm a correspondent here, and I'm actually going to be doing some coverage on Black Ukrainians. When you are a correspondent abroad, you essentially work as your own editor, and it's your discretion of what you choose to report to your boss as a story of importance. Now, if you're at the New York Times, the Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, you name it, and you are a bureau chief, if you don't think that those people are of interest, you don't consider them a part of general society, then you're not going to prioritize them in your coverage. And so that's one of the primary reasons, I would say the primary reason why you don't see them is because foreign correspondents are not there, and mainly because for foreign correspondents who don't look like us um, are not out there to prioritize our people. But you're right, brother. We, we're, we're everywhere, and my work here uh, will be to introduce those people uh, to to audiences like yours, and I'm going to be doing that in the next few weeks. You know, this morning when I saw you on MSNBC, I knew there was a reason why I needed to and I had to speak to you because, again, I just got educated on that part of the world. So thank you so kindly. I'm probably going to go back to that a little bit later because uh, now I'm intrigued. Uh, now I, I I asked you for an interview on one subject. It seems like we're going to have, if you have the time, we may have another yeah, five problem, No problem. Great no, no, to, no to problem. go on another subject. But anyhow, let me ask you this. First of all, give us the genesis of the current Ukrainian, uh, Russian, NATO problem. Uh, in your words, because I've heard it in different forms. I am not sure what is accurate, what isn't. So please give us the proper narrative as you see it. Thank you very much. So here's the thing. Everyone's going to point to 2014 as the the genesis of this current conflict, and that is correct. And so Russia created a, and I literally mean created a, a story that Russian speakers were under attack. So he literally illegally encroached into sovereign land and, you know, on this false premise that Russian citizens were being attacked and were being abused and took over the Luhansk and, Dom- and Donbass regions, which are in eastern Ukraine, and illegally annexed Crimea. OK, and I'm going to break down why those regions are particularly important. And so you heard me earlier where I talked about Catherine the Great. and You know, it's important to realize that Ukraine, it was during the Soviet Union, which basically 1917 into 1991, Ukraine was considered the breadbasket, Mm -hmm. per se, right? And so 
this is a huge country uh, in Europe. And so and the land is very, very fertile, fertile. And so, you know, you had people, you had all kinds of people, including Jewish people who were expelled from Western Europe in the 12th and 13th centuries coming to Ukraine. And so, but also during the, um, you know, also during the SARS period, you have Russian, uh, ethnic Russians who came, who migrated to, you know, Ukraine uh, for job opportunities, et cetera, particularly in agriculture because of the land, it was easier to till, you know, and you can, you know, you can make money from it. And so they started populating, you know, Luhansk and Donbass regions hundreds of years ago, right? That's important context. Uh, and you had Crimea, and you know, several hundred years ago, it was majority Crimean Tartar. You asked about ethnic diversity. Uh, Crimean Tartars are their very unique ethnic group, right? And so, at first, you know, you had the um, the Greeks who 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 dominated, and then you had the uh, Ottoman Empire that dominated. Catherine the Great came in and took it. And I'm not going to say what year because it just it, it evades me right now because I don't want to be incorrect. But it, but just it's important to know that Catherine the Great you know, conquered, um, you know, Crimea. And then slowly but surely that population in Crimea became less and less Crimean Tartar and became more and more um, Russian speaking. And so Crimean Tartars, you know, they're, they're Muslim, right? And so when you, so, so I'm, I'm giving you that important context because it goes back to why he wants this land. And so he's basing it on this false premise. It's not only a false premise, but it's the idea that this was always our land. Mm -hmm. That's what he wants to do. And so to make it simple, just as, you know, uh, uh, pilgrims, European pilgrims came over to the United States, you know, you have this mirage of the fact that they discovered America, what they right. did was came over and killed the in, in, indigenous population. Right. right? That, that is what Russia did through its empire. It's no different. Right. They came and murdered indigenous communities. They are an imperial, bloodthirsty, genocidal culture. Just like America, let's just keep that straight, right? And so, when you so so right so 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 these centuries long stories are deeply etched in people's minds here, right? And so because it has it's a story about displacement, it's a story about you know reparations that they've never gotten. But anyway, going back to so, but but it definitely goes back to 2014. And now, when you think about uh, and I brought up colonialization, this is really important because during the Soviet period. There, you know, you had the former Warsaw Pact countries, you know, you have Poland, and then you had, you know, these countries in Central Europe, like Hungary, you had, Georgia, um, well, Georgia was at USSR, right? They were gotcha. The yeah, USSR, yes, correct. Part of the 15, right? Then you had to, no, again, you know, but, but listen, you're close, don't worry, you know, you're close, but you're dealing with the Warsaw Pact countries, that's Romania, you know, and then you have Bulgaria, right? Because those were the, like, you know, th those were the countries that were satellites, right? And right, so the buffers. All, the buffers precisely. And so right. after the USR, USSR fell, they immediately went to NATO because they said, we, we've all experienced this Russian colonialization and we were not culturally Russian oriented. We are not into this Russian sphere of political influence. They wanted to go more into the West. And so after in the early 2000s and going into the late, two, you know, early 2010s, you had basically one third of NATO which it was composed of these former Warsaw Pact and in, 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 in USSR countries, but including the Baltic countries, right? And so the culture of NATO shifted when these countries came into it. And so I'm pretty sure you heard a lot of discourse about, you know, um, you know um, people saying, hey, we do not want, you know, NATO is this imperial nation that's led by the United States. It's true to an extent, but it's, compl it's true, but it's complicated. And so... Once you decenter the United States and realize that these former Warsaw Pact and USSR countries were, um, you know, w w wanted to change, w wanted to join NATO simply because they did not have the military power to protect themselves. Right. And then it becomes less about America and more about these own countries wanting their own sovereignty. And so Ukraine is a part of that because. Basically, they're like that one straggling country left behind as far as mm -hmm. the EU. Eastern European members are concerned, like, come on, y'all. It's like, come on, man, you could do it. You could do it. You could do it. And so they're so they're like so so basically Ukraine is not under Article 5, which means that if you mess with all of us, if you mess with one of us, you got all of us. So Ukraine is not in that position anymore. And Russia is pinpointing Ukraine because 
he realizes that this demo, this democratic nation, if 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 you have if you allow this to flourish, then people in Russia are going to think, oh my God, we can do that too. Right. So 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 so, so it's not so much a NATO thing because listen, if Putin cared about NATO, he would have attacked the NATO country. But Putin don't want that smoke, and he and he he don't want that smoke, right? And so what he's doing is he's bullying this country and using it as a chess piece to pressure particularly Germany, right? Because Germany, what one thing people don't know, up until 1989, they, you know, Russia split that country in half. Right, Eastern right? Germany. Had, Eastern Germany, right? Because you had Angela Merkel who spoke from in Russia. Exactly. In right? fact, she right. she was under that domain. Absolutely. She was yeah, part yeah. of the USSR, yeah. Important context, yeah. So that's what I'm saying. So all this context, and I'm happy that I have the time to really break this down to you because all of this stuff matters. If you don't understand colonization, because that's the thing, going back to, 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 to Germany, they have their own fear. So people are like, man, Germany, a bunch of punks that the third. And it's like, okay, you can say that, but it's it, it's a little more complicated than that. But at any rate, Ukraine is it, it right now is a country where they definitely want they want EU membership, they want NATO membership, and they have a really legitimate reason um besides Russia in order to justify being so because they are the most combat ready military in all of Europe not necessarily most technologically advanced but they're ready but, but they're but they're more so than France Germany or or any other country i mean you you can rival their combat readiness to that of the United States right for, you know for, for for the wrong reason because we shouldn't be invading other countries well that's a whole another story brother we can have a conversation about but we're talking about Ukraine now but yeah that's that's a general synopsis that 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 is simply amazing, and I don't think uh, you have heard this entire articulation on mainstream on the mainstream media. And we are here yeah, just yeah. sitting down, thinking it's you know uh, oh it's just the fight between NATO and the United States, and it, it's a it's a lot deeper than that. It, it, it's extremely com. It, brother, this is so complex. Right. Very complex. Now you are in Kiev. Uh, what is the attitude there now? What's the feeling? Do people feel like I think. The, 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 the original belief was that since he is way on the eastern side, that he would have just taken, maybe come and taken the land, those lands that are in dispute right now. But now I understand that in Belarus, there are battalions there as well that could that are probably a few hours away from Kiev, which presents a problem if that's his intent, correct? That's absolutely correct. So, so north of Kiev, you know, it's about two and a half hours away. And so literally, if you take a drive up, that's all it takes now. Belarus. To Belarus, yeah, exactly, yeah. to the north. And so, you know, keep in mind that Chernobyl is north of us, right? Oh, <laughs> so, yeah, oh God. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. And I've been twice. And so those, you know, and they have the type of equipment that can handle the radiation to come through there. Because I've been to Chernobyl twice. Right. And, and, and I was actually going to go, I don't know if you know the brother Malcolm Nance, who's on, who's on MSNBC. Of course, I Nance, yeah, the CIA guy, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so, so basically, he was going to. He was an NSA, um, NSA so guy. I'm, an I'm NSA, sorry, yeah. NSA. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it's it. Listen, it's, it's all good. It's the same to most of us, but it is NSA. But basically, um, he, we were supposed to go up to Chernobyl to, um, you know, to visit because he's never been. I've gone twice already. But, uh-huh. uh, but, but at any rate, um, they can make it through that zone. In a matter of you know, in, in a matter of days and fighting, and so what 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 the what what Malcolm Nance was saying and his own assessment was that they after a few days of fighting, they can surround this the capital, but they're not going to take it. And the reason why they're not going to take it is that these people in 2014 during the Euro Maidan, um, more than a hundred people died, and they faced down the state security services who shot at them and kill their fellow countrymen. I remember so that. that. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. They're, 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 yeah. These are fighters, man. They're not going to just... Yeah, fight. Three no, million no. of them. No, no. And, and so Malcolm, in, in this city alone, okay, and there's 40 plus million people in the country, and it's a huge, huge country. And so the way that Malcolm described it was, uh, this place will turn into the white Taliban. Um <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, uh, listen, listen, it sounds like, but, but, but it's real because every person that has the finger that works and they have access to a gun is subject to shoot any Russian in boots and in military um, gear. military gear. I mean, because, yeah, because these people 
are extremely resilient. They're not going to be welcoming Russia with cookies and milk. That That's just for sure. Now, I'll tell you what they will do. What they will do is that um, they will take the entire, they could take the entirety of the Donetsk region. And as you know, that there are some uh, uh, bomb, there, there are some bomb, bomb shellings in uh yeah they, in, it, in uh, today actually they bombed a, a elementary school or something and a couple days ago yeah 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 that's correct and so basically what what, can, what could happen is that the russian military could take the entirety of that region many people think that they have all of donetsk and that's not true they uh-huh. have a nice chunk of it but they don't have the entirety of it so they can take that and they can take um maybe um some other larger city and then they can come in from the south through the Black Sea and the Azov Seas. And basically what they can do is come from um, come from the Donetsk and then come from the Azov Sea from the south and kind of like bring in more position and come together, right? right. They could do that part. But as far as advancing further than that, that's going to be rough because it, simply put, they don't have enough soldiers. Right. They have to literally throw all their soldiers here because the Nazis came here and took over. They had double from my understanding, double the number of soldiers to take over this country. Russia doesn't have that type of, of, of manpower. In order right. They would, have to throw, they would have to leave their country entirely defenseless in order to, take to over come and, and try to take something yeah. where people are going to fight them. Now, that's a pretty modern city, Kiev, right? Absolutely. It's just like being in, let's say, Houston or New York or Boston or yeah. one of those places. Yeah. Yeah. Very, yeah now, um, very modern. Well, um, I, I'm glad I spoke to you because I, I want to I, truly. I better back up because I spoke mm-hmm. to two other uh, people who follow the uh, Russia, uh, the Russia Ukraine issue, and one of uh, one of them, Norman Solomon. In fact, uh, another friend of mine. He said, "Well, you know, Egberto, think about if um, Russia put a whole fl- a fleet in our Gulf, and he put some people in the." Canadian border and the Mexican border, how would we as the United States react? Now, before you answer, you came with a very important perspective to first note that both Russia and the United States are colonizers. So in effect is one colonizer versus another colonizer in, in this respect. Now, how do you measure what Norman Solomon said you know, I, I think what Norman wasn't trying to be pro-Russian. I think what Norman was doing is saying, practically speaking, Russia is scared to hell of NATO. Practically, yes, but actually, no. Okay, okay. So let me bring. Okay, so let me bring up the practical. Look, and I argued this in a in a recent article with Foreign Policy. If America was threatening to invade Mexico, for example. Mm-hmm. Right. And we were and we had a hundred thousand troops at their border, and we were constantly menacing them with takeover threats, I would have no problem with it. Mm-hmm. But that's but that's what I'm saying. Practically, if that were the case, that I, I would have no problem with it. And so it, it, it and, and that type of argument dangerously flows into the what aboutism, even though he did not intend it to be that way. And I'm going to explain why. Mm-hmm. Because let's go, let's go to the actual actually happening is that NATO has no interest in militarily having a standoff with Russia because it's suicide. Mm-hmm. Okay, Russia is a nuclear power. Exactly. I'm glad you point that out. Yeah. They are the they they are a pure nuclear power. Remember when I said Russia doesn't want that smoke, but NATO if it listen, America don't want that smoke either. They are right. a nuclear power. Now their conventional military doesn't stand a chance against it. It, it, it would lose one on one versus NATO, right? Right. Um, but but from a nuclear standpoint, you don't want those problems from either side. And so the reality of it is very simple. Going back to why I gave you that earlier history and context. Right. The only reason why, listen, if Russia spent more time building up its own country, building up its own economy as opposed to threatening countries that no longer want to be a part of it, then they wouldn't have to worry about NATO, right? And so NATO is only attractive if you fear a Russian invasion or a Russian attack. Uh, and, and what they and what the what what these former Warsaw Pact countries and USSR countries see in Russia are three things that happen to a smart Russian. 
if you are a um, Boris Nemtsov, if you are a politician who is fighting for democratic freedom, they just kill you and they'll kill you near the Kremlin, which is what happened to Boris Nemtsov, right? Mm -hmm. Now, if you are somebody like Alexei Navalny, if they don't kill you, they lock they you up. Prison, they lock you up. Now, if you are the guy that created the social media site Contact, you know, which just means in contact in Russian, and it's basically the Russian Facebook, what they do is they tell you, give us your data, give it to us now, and you refuse, they just rush you out of the country, right? And so this guy, this very intelligent mind that could be of use to Russia, is in the West. Right. Okay. And so they, they scare you off. If they can't kill you, they imprison you, or they just flat out kill you. Those are the three things that happen. Now, if you're in Ukraine, do you really want to be a part of that? Because it's, it, 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 it's really, does it, come, it shouldn't come as a surprise that the co-founder of Google, who is a Russian, is in the United States. Right, right. So, and, 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 and so, uh, again, Brin. this is important. Yeah, but see, this is, yes, but see, this is important context. Because if you are thinking about NATO, Right. NATO is a military alliance. And look, it has all these complications. And again, brother, if you bring me on the show, I, I'm not a I'm not a pro NATO person at all. And I can break down to you on a separate um, conversation about my views on defense. I think the <clears throat> American industrial complex needs to be completely dismantled. Um, I think our military budget is bloated. It needs to be cut significantly. I can give you a whole spiel on that. But the thing about but. This is, but but that situation is not what we're talking about. Today. Right, you can't. You have to keep apples and apples, right? Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so basically, we need to keep focus going back to the person who who brought up this scenario of what if this and what if that. What's happening right now is that if Russia was not a threat to these other people's security, this wouldn't be an issue for Russia. And even if Ukraine did become a made a member of NATO, NATO serves no harm to Russia whatsoever. Um, because the reality of it is a country that really is self-destructing anyway. It's mm -hmm. kind of like the Soviet Union, you know, uh, with the way I tell people about the USSR. You know, let's just say if there was not this big diplomatic push by Ronald Reagan to really, you know, to really un un undo the USSR. If it didn't fall in 1991, it would have fallen in 2001 because it was economically unsustainable. Right? Right. It was a political un sustainable structure. And that's the same thing with Russia. Their population is dwindling every year. It's a country that covers more than a dozen time zones, and it has roughly 150,000 people for a country that big, right? And America has three times the population. And so just, I mean, I'm just- With an economy the size of Italy. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. You get what I'm saying? And so when you think about NATO, NATO isn't invested in, you know, in, in trying to destabilize this large country because again, they, they, they control so much of the energy market. Anything happens with Russia, you know, gas is a globally traded commodity. And so um, you know, they export very little gas to the United States. But because it's a globally traded commodity, we are going to hit it at our gas pump. So it's not economically feasible or makes sense for NATO to want to have some military confrontation with Russia. It's not good for business. Right. Well, look, let me let me tell you, first of all, you've been extraordinarily enlightened, Mr. Starr. Let me ask you something. First of all, how long have you been in Kiev? Oh, listen, oh, man, I've been coming back and forth since 2009. And so I came here as a Fulbright grantee to take a, a you know, Russian language course. And then I did a, a photo project on black Ukrainian. And so. Now, um, I'm starting a couple of businesses. One business, the tourism business. Next summer, 2023, I plan on bringing 600 Americans here and groups, you know, in, in groups of 25 people, mm -hmm. um, starting in the late spring of, of next year and going into the early fall, you know, in October of next year. And so um, I'm starting that business. The website is going to go up um, in April. Um, and then I have a clothing business here that's kind of like ethnic modern wear here. I would have to show you to, to really explain, but that's going to be coming up soon. But I've been here since January. I planned on uh, the beginning of January. I, I planned on staying for three weeks. I was supposedly January 31st. But given what's happening here, mm -hmm. I felt like my presence was needed to be on the ground. And also, listen, I have friends here who I love and care for and this in, in, in my love for the people I've grown to see here are, are far is, is deeper than friendship. And, you know, I, I, I would feel a little guilty 
if I stay, if I left and I wasn't able to help and contribute and to be on the ground and provide knowledge to people like yourself, you know, I, I would, I'm much more useful to you being here in Ukraine and, and giving people on the ground analysis because of my knowledge and my experience. There are a few people who can give that analysis like I can. And the stories that I'm going to be covering over the next few weeks won't happen. You know, they wouldn't be happening if it wasn't for me, particularly a black person who understands. Well, you know, and that, that is why I just love your perspective again, because what we get is a status quo, plutocratic type pers- perspective whenever, you know, you get the standard reporters. That, and that is not to knock the, yeah. the standard reporters. I mean, I knocked them enough for for being <laughs> milk toast. Okay, yeah, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but what we need to do is we have to have perspective. And like I said, when I heard you this morning, that's what I heard. Perspective. Tell us a little bit about your podcast. Tell us a little bit about how people can get to you. Yeah, thank you very much. So my podcast is called Black Diplomat, and it's a podcast that focuses on the intersection of race and foreign policy. And I named it Black Diplomats because I want Black people, I don't care if you've never left the country, I want Black people to know that they are Black diplomats. And for my podcast, I purposely want people to say Black, right? You know, hey, you're going to say Black because I want people to associate Black people with foreign policy. And so each week, you know, I primarily focus on Eastern Europe and Ukrainian and Russian politics, but I have people of color um, I have people who are local, who are indigenous, right? And so, yes, yeah, black diplomats. And so, I have a, I have the most diverse panel of experts talking about Russia, Ukraine, and Eastern Europe than any other podcast that you're going to see. If you want to get to it, it's on all the major podcast platforms. I encourage people to go to iTunes to give me a five star rating because I do great content, and also on my Twitter, Russian underscore star with two R's. People can go and I have a you know ways in which people can contribute to my podcast because this is by myself. I don't have any support. I'm just doing this solo and I'm I really survive, I really focus and thrive off of people who are investing in the work that I do. Let me tell you, I am first of all very impressed. I want to thank you for giving me the this uh, extended amount of time. I'm glad that we cut it from the 10 minutes that we we're going to do right after the yeah, show yeah, to where yeah. we could have some time to spend together because I've learned a lot and I intend to have you uh, as much as I can on different yeah. issues because I can see that there's some there's a hell of an intersectionality here. Terrell Germain Starr also on Twitter at Russian underscore star, host of the Black Diplomats podcast. Please check him out. I'll have it all in the blog. Thank you so kindly for having been on Politics Done Right. Thank you, brother. Appreciate it. Don't forget, please support the show. Support the station as well. Why am I asking you to support KPFT 90.1 FM Houston? It is extremely important. Remember that KPFT embraces cultural diversity. We represent the entire Houston, the entire metropolitan area. We represent the entire country. KPFT supports programming that's not the status quo. We challenge the status quo. We don't give you what the corporatocracy just want to give you. We are here to tell you not only the truth, but to express it in a way that we all understand. That's KPFT's job. We are not trying to forget the past. We embrace the past and we are there to celebrate the future because things change. What am I saying? Please remember KPFT 90.1 FM is a gem. We are in the process of moving. We are in the process of relocating to a new space. We need you more than we have ever needed you before to keep this thing going. Over 50 years of giving you great info, not only progressive programming, but alternative uh, programming. What do we mean by alternative programming, we mean things that you are not going to get elsewhere. We also mean telling you the truth about things that others may not want you to know. So please remember, folks, call 713-526-5738. Again, that number is 713-526-5738. Three, eight. But even better, visit kpft.org, click the donate button, make sure you select Politics Done Right for the program. The form will give you your donate and gift options. Please remember to keep 
your community radio station in your minds. Keep KPFT on your mind. Talk about it. Tell your friends about it. Tell them you know about this station in town, 90.1 FM Houston, that needs your support. That is there to provide that nourishment that we need. KPFT 90.1 FM Houston. You can listen and or watch Politics Done Right Mondays through Fridays on Facebook Live at facebook.com slash politics done right or on YouTube Live at politics done right dot com slash YouTube. Please do not forget to follow me on Twitter for updates. My Twitter handle is at Egberto Willies at E-G-B-E-R-T-O-W-I-L-L. I-E-S. But don't you forget, listen to us live on air at KPFT 90.1 FM on Thursdays at noon and at Fridays at 11 a.m. all central time. Please get one of my several books out there. As I see it, Class Warfare, the only resort to right-wing doom for a contribution of $120. It's worth it. How to talk to your right-wing relatives, friends, and neighbors for a contribution of $120. How to make America utopia, take away the economy from those who rigged it for a pledge of $120. Get any two of those books for $200, any three of those books for $250. The contributions for my books go directly to support our station, KPFT 90.1 FM. Alternatively, folks, please get your basic KPFT-only membership for $40, a Pacifica-only membership for $25, or choose from one of our many other gifts for your contribution. Just go to kpft.org, choose Politics Done Right for the program, and select an option either for our books or something else to support the station. It is definitely worth it. Well, folks, that's it for today. You know how I'm going to end this baby. My name is Egberto Willis. This is Politics Done Right. And you know how I end this baby. I am what? Out! Welcome to Politics Done Right. I am your host, Egberto Willis. This is a progressive program that will take the mystery out of politics. This is the program that will encourage you to make sure government becomes we the people. Whether you are liberal, progressive, conservative, or otherwise, you get to hear your point of view. We are an independent media outlet that, unlike mainstream media beholden to corporations, we only owe allegiance to you. Remember, you can also send me a tweet at E-G-B-E-R-T-O-W-I-L-L-I-E-S. That is at Egberto Willis. Let us engage. It is politics done right. Right.